What people say they want to read or watch is different than what they click. And if I just went by clicks, I would just write about Kim Kardashian all day. But that's not really what we needed. Every employee at Blavity Gets Equity. I mean, oh, wow. Yes, I know, I'm a crazy lady. I asked the people who gave me money to help me finish raising them around. I don't think enough people put the burden on others to help them be successful when mm. actually it is their job and they want to. It's a terrible problem when you are the underrepresented group trying to get information to one another that is mm -hmm. accurate, that mm -hmm. is in real time, and without media and platforms, you wind up just perpetuating the cycle over and over again. The people who are really making the big decisions need to have inclusion and diversity as a part of their own values, because it mm -hmm. does make a difference. And when I say diverse, mm -hmm. I don't just mean black people. I went out to raise money, and I was really strict at the time. And I said, I want all black investors. I want an all black board. And this is a black media company. So the people who own this need to be a reflection of our community. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, all the black people said. Young and Profiters, welcome back to the show. And today we have a true unicorn in the tech industry with us, a black female co-founder and CEO of a digital media startup who succeeded despite steep odds to forge an incredibly successful portfolio of companies. Morgan Debon is the founder, CEO, and chairman of Blavity Incorporated, a leading digital media company for black culture and millennials. Morgan has been recognized by Forbes 30 Under 30 and America's top 50 women in tech. And she also acts as an advisor to influential global companies like Pepsi and American Airlines. Morgan is going to share with us how she built an influential media empire, and she's going to give us some pointers on how to navigate some of the most challenging parts of founding a company, like getting VC funding, creating a board, attracting diverse talent talent, and improving your leadership. Morgan, welcome to Young and Profiting Podcast. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. I'm so happy to have you on the show. And you know, Morgan, you've accomplished so much at such a young age. And I know a lot of your success comes from being able to effectively straddle so many different environments and different communities from Silicon Valley to St. Louis. So talk to us about your childhood in St. Louis. And how did that really impact your outlook on life thereafter? Yeah, I was born and raised in St. Louis, Missouri, you know, middle of America, very like American values, you know. Um, I think that one thing about being in the Midwest is like people work hard, but also maybe don't make it to where they want to go. So mm -hmm. this kind of idea of hard work pays off. And if you just like buckle up by your bootstraps is what you're taught, right? Like living in America and like that's what they say. But in reality, it's not just hard work, <laughs> right? And I saw that and I think I observed that time and time again. And when I eventually moved to Silicon Valley straight after graduation, um, I went to Wash U for undergrad and moved out to the Bay Area. I was like, oh, this is not about hard work at all. This is about access, opportunity. Yes, you need discipline. Yes, you need to be focused. You know, there's all these different things you need, but it is not just about brute force. And uh, I think that's one of the things that I really encourage people to reconsider as they're building towards their financial freedom and their wealth journey because, or their business, because this hustle culture, I think has messed up our perception of what's possible. Mm. I love that. And I know that in your work, you often talk about code switching throughout your childhood, how you always mm -hmm. had to sort of like be a certain person in one place and then sort of switch off in a different place depending on your environment. And I think a lot of people who are listening to this podcast, they might not even know what that means. They might not understand that people have to do that. So talk to us about that. Yeah, you know, I am a black woman and I grew up in a, a diverse set of different sets of schooling. You know, I went to a Catholic all-girls school. Mm. I'm not Catholic, <laughs> you know. Um, I'm Christian, but not, not that, you know, that's a very different type of Christian. Um, I then went to a primarily white institution, Wash U, where the Black population was 4 to 6%, depending on the year. And I always view the ability to be one of the underrepresented groups as an opportunity to one, learn how other people think, how other cultures work. And then two, also re-establish like a really clear grounding of who I am, not just what society has propelled me to be. And I think that learning that skill at a young age, whether I wanted to be the other or not, 
caused me to have this resiliency, but then also have this ability to be flexible. So when I moved into the workspace, I moved into different professional spaces, I was able to say, okay, I know how these white boys in Silicon Valley move. I know how the corporate industry moves. I know how to have a conversation with someone who I don't necessarily agree with their religious beliefs, but we're still able to have a connection and not necessarily be intimidated by moving in and out of these different groups. Mm, Yeah, that makes sense. And so I'm Palestinian American, a really crazy time to be a Palestinian American in America. And, you know, I grew up in a way where I feel like I had more privilege than maybe other Arab Americans had in America. My dad was a doctor. He worked really hard. And and then I felt like I have this extreme responsibility to be very successful and sort of help other people along the way because I just feel like I started off at a different place from other mm-hmm. people. Do you feel this same similar? Because I hear that like you went to private school and like probably yeah. a very different experience from other African-American people from that region, especially. Yeah, you're right. And I actually, my dad's a doctor as well. So mm. we're not surprising. We kind of both wound up in similar, similar, but different. But um, yeah, I do feel like because I was able to see the access of opportunity that I had compared to um, other folks, Black folks who lived in St. Louis. Specifically, I went to a public school for all all the way through middle school Mm -hmm. and then private for high school. And so I was able to see all my friends from middle school who didn't make it, you Mm. know, who didn't graduate from high school, who, you know, had children really, really young, who are still in St. Louis right now and didn't necessarily make it out of the city. Um, And not that there's anything wrong with staying where you're from, but... (laughs) If they had had a choice, I think they would have chosen a different life for themselves. And I think that the internet and being able to have access to Silicon Valley has given me the chance to say, okay, how do I build a platform to bring other people along and speed up the likelihood and reduce that gap between if I had the opportunity and the access, I would be more successful. I would have more wealth, more savings, more freedom, more control over who who I want to be and how I spend my time. Mm. Um, So definitely, I think that was a huge part of like how I wound up doing this. Yeah, totally. Um, And so you ended up graduating at the top of your class at Washington University in St. Louis. And that's not exactly like a feeder school for Silicon Valley. So how did you end up transitioning and, and going to Silicon Valley? It is not a feeder school for Silicon Valley (laughs) at all. People thought I was a little bit nuts. This was, again, like, what, 12, 13 years ago? I mean, like, Silicon Valley was not really in vogue like it is now, our startup life. And so um, I worked at a tech company in St. Louis, like one of the very few, as an intern my junior, senior year. And I took the time to understand, okay, how did this guy get all this money? Like the founder was like, it was just very confusing to me because it's just so so not normal in the day-to-day life of what I was seeing from like entrepreneurs and business folks. And he told me, I said, well, where should I go when I graduate? Where should I be applying? And he said, you should apply to Singapore. You should go and look for companies in Singapore and try to get to Singapore post-graduation. And I was like, look, this black girl is not going to Singapore. <laughs> That's a stretch. What's my number two option? <laughs> okay. What is my number two option? And um, he said, okay, you can go to Silicon Valley, but there's a lot of the, the dot-com wealth gain has already been done, but there's still a lot of room for growth there. So, okay. So I started looking at companies whose products I used. And at the time I was filing my taxes for the first time because I had my little internship and I was like, you know, making some money and, uh, and then I was using mint.com to manage that money. And so I wound up applying to a company called Intuit, which has grown tremendously since then and, um, moved out to the Bay area to work there. So it was definitely not the pathway that was traditional for the cohort of people that I was around. And yet the beautiful thing about kind of going outside your pathway is that once you get there, you actually find a whole new tribe of people Mm -hmm. that do exactly the same thing. Mm, I love that. So um, when I got there, it was certainly a culture shock from a vocabulary perspective. You know, I didn't go to Stanford, so I, I didn't like know all of the things that people were talking about, but the energy was my energy. You know, it's people who wanted to do big things, who wanted to build for millions and billions of people 
who wanted to make an impact at an early age, didn't want to wait till they were 60 to have a say, right? Um, and that was really energizing for me. Yeah. And it sounds like you did find a community, but were there any points in this, you know, experience in Silicon Valley where you were treated like an outsider or felt like an outsider? Yeah. So I think I found a community of people who were like-minded, but not necessarily who, um, I think had the social awareness that I had grown up with. Mm. So because it's a very homogenous community of mostly white and Asian men, we can talk the talk about venture funding and tech, but when it comes to, hey, why don't we potentially like put the product in Spanish? It's like, well, why would we do that? Mm. <laughs> you know, or like, well, well, you know, when we do our user testing, why are the only people we user test like just stay at home moms in Palo Alto? Like maybe we should get some more diversity in our like UI UX research study groups, you know? So I found myself having friction on the how mm. to get things done and feeling like I was explaining myself and educating them, these people who make TEDx and what I make, mm. you know, who are yeah. the big bosses in the room. Um, and I made a decision at that point after a few years of like learning the game, oh, this could be the rest of my life. Like mm. I could stay in corporate and be the girl who's like explaining all the things but is that really, is that going to be the fastest way, one, for change? Because I would mm -hmm. only be at that company if I was doing it. And two, is that how I want to spend my time? Is that the impact that I want to make? And um, that was the friction between loving my work, loving the ecosystem, identifying, you know what, we're not quite there yet. And then trying to figure out, well, what is my role in this space? Yeah. And then I know around that time, you started to really see like an opportunity in the marketplace, especially when it came to brown and black people. What mm -hmm. was it that you saw? What gaps did you see? Yeah. So about two and a half, three years in, um, Michael Brown was killed in St. Louis. Mm. So I was having a moment where um, I would go into my cubicle in downtown San Francisco and I would be heartbroken, just screaming internally <laughs> at the computer on my phone and meanwhile the world's just like operating like nothing is wrong you know how I feel I know how it feels <laughs> I'm going through it right now you know everybody's just bumping it along and you're like hello this is up like what is going on you know and how can I be helpful how can I leverage my platform how can I use my skills my unique set of skills to make an impact. And um, I didn't have a platform at the time, right? I mean, I'm 24 years old, <laughs> right? But I did know have skills. Mm -hmm. And I did have the ability to say, you know what? I now have some network. Let me figure out how I can create a unique brand and company that is an advocate for this group of people that's often overlooked and more importantly doesn't have the information distribution systems that mm. we needed to get information from place to place in an accurate way mm. it's crazy that I'm saying this right now because it's like the exact same problem is happening yeah in a lot of different communities and it's terrible it's a terrible problem when you are the underrepresented group trying to get information to one another that mm -hmm. is accurate mm -hmm. that is in real time and that you're trying to get resources to the people on the ground, which in our case was back in St. Louis, like bail bonds. You know, people were going to jail. We needed to get them out of jail, right? Mm. People were then driving to different cities where all these uprisings were happening. You need to get them money. It's an entire cluster. And without media and information sharing and platforms, you wind up just perpetuating the cycle over and over again. So that was mm. the problem. And that's when I said... I'm going to take this leap and really commit to over the next three to four months, figuring out how to quit my job and be full time working on Blavity. Wow. So I didn't realize that Blavity first started off basically to help um, a human rights movement within America. That's yes. basically why it started. Right. And then it's evolved. And we'll talk about the evolution. So it really started off with you creating an email newsletter. Right. Yes. Why did you start that way? Cheap, free, 
I was broke. You know, I think email newsletters are smart because you can just get to people fast. Uh, you don't have the dependency on social network algorithms, um, mm. much like SMS, right? Like you're right in people's fingertips. It's really hard for people not to open emails or at least scan the subject line. Yeah. Um, and so that was the my lowest barrier to entry to be able to get to the masses of people that we wanted to connect with. And how did you first collect emails? Well, what I did probably wasn't legal. <laughs> <laughs> but again, it doesn't matter until you get big when you start doing stuff. But yeah. um, we, I scraped emails from like when people wouldn't BCC list yeah. within our little community. I'm like, oh, immediately adding you to my email list. Now, I do not recommend this to anybody. But listening. 10 years ago, that was like all, <laughs> that was normal 10 years ago. So you're, yeah. It's different times now. Different but, times. Yeah. And I love email newsletters, guys. I just really started getting into email like the last year and it's been awesome. Like people really click those things. They really e uh, open it up. And to your point, especially when it's like sensitive topics, you don't have the algorithm and social media networks like shadow banning you or you could just right. get the word out. Um, so how did you figure out the kind of content that your audience really wanted to read? What was the ways mm -hmm. that you got your content ideas for this email newsletter? Yeah. So there's two things. Um, on one end, we were able to track all the information in the newsletter, right? You're able to track what people are watching, what people are clicking on, if they're sharing the newsletter, if your newsletter is growing organically, what I called and what the world calls is a viral coefficient, right? So for every two or three people who sign up for the newsletter, do you get another one to three people? If so, you've got a good machine going on. You know, that's very organic and that's going to allow you to grow quickly and cheaply. And that's what you're looking from a Silicon Valley perspective as a product manager. That's what I was looking for was, is this sticky enough that people are going to share it on their own so that I don't have to try to build a huge marketing engine? The mm -hmm. product and the value should be so good that they want to share it. And, you know, we learned a lot of different things really quickly. I mean, the good thing about a daily newsletter is that you have a daily data set every day. And um, what we found was a few different things. One, what people say they want to read or watch is different than what they click. Mm. And as a curator of information, as a platform, you have to decide and have really strong values or else you could go to a place where people are just clicking mm. uh, without any sort of value to that person, if yes. that makes sense, right? Um, if I just went by clicks, I would just write about Kim Kardashian all day. Mm. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not really what we needed. So then we had to figure out how to blend different content themes together to get someone hooked into the ecosystem and then be able to then discover other things that they maybe wouldn't have clicked on, but since they're there, find a lot of value from. Mm. And so that's that was the beginning of starting to build out different brands and different platforms and really thinking about the Blavity Inc. Inc. as a company ecosystem and, and really trying to understand that Black isn't a monolith. And there's people who are interested in news and politics, and there's people who are interested in travel and leisure, and there's people interested in technology, and they may be in also interested in Real Housewives of Atlanta, and that's fine. But they want those things at different points in their day. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. And where did the name Blavity come from? Yes, Blavity stands for Black Gravity, and it's a term that we used in college to describe all of the Black people coming together. So... You know, again, we went to a primar primarily white institution called PWI, and you know, this might have been your experience as well, but like, you know, you go to lunch, everybody sits with who they identify with at lunch. Mm -hmm. And so you couldn't tell the Black people anything. As far as I'm concerned, I went to an HBCU because <laughs> it was like Black, Black, Black all the time, especially at lunch and parties and things like that. And anytime we would all discover each other, have critical conversations, People would be doing homework, people would be talking about dating, like whatever was going on. It was just this really beautiful moment in the day where you felt seen and heard and felt like you were part of a community, even though when you walked out that lunchroom, it's back to you and in, <laughs> you and two other people in your Econ 101 class. Yeah. So I know that you started Blavity as a side hustle while you were at Intuit. Talk to us about what that experience was like. How are you spending? How are you spending your time? 
Yes, I um, woke up really early. You know, we were on the West Coast, so I would like wake up, do East Coast meetings, uh, go to work, walk to work. I was saving every penny I had. So, you know, I was eating boiled eggs and oatmeal and you know, avocados are cheap in Cali. Um, I would even bring Tupperware to work because we had a lot of free food, just like shameless, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was just saving every penny that I had. Um and after work, I would head to like happy hours or founder meetups, just trying to immerse myself in the community and get to know who's who and the players and how the tech industry work. In January of 2014, I was starting on Blavity. We launched our first version of the product in the spring, the first version of the website in July of 2014. Mike Brown was killed in August. Mm -hmm. And if he hadn't been murdered... I wouldn't have, I think, felt the urgency to quit. Like, I think I would have stayed on the side hustle, main hustle dance for another year. But at that point, I said, okay, I have to figure out my finances to be able to, to quit. So by October, I was fully out of the, out of the business um, at Intuit. And I took on more side hustles, actually, once I quit, because I still had a downtown apartment in downtown San Francisco, and I was financing, I was bootstrapping the company. So I was paying for the engineers, the bloggers, the site maintenance and everything. Um, so I took on a consulting job. I arbitraged an apartment so that I could, you know, I rented out an apartment and then rented it out to somebody else for a higher price. I mean, I was literally just hustling, trying to make ends meet so that all of, as much of my discretionary income as possible could go into the business. Yeah. So I have no experience with fundraising. I started my companies totally bootstrapped. I think a lot of people don't have the experience that I had. Uh, it was like a slow organic experience. And then I got really huge retainers as soon mm. as I started my companies. So let's talk about fundraising because you have a lot of experience with it. Talk to us about the steps that we have to take to get VC money. What are the things we need to prepare, things we need to create? How do we go out and find people to pitch to? Just walk us through that whole process. You know, if I could have stayed bootstrapping, I would have. I think it's the better option <laughs> for most people. Um, and in my scenario, the reason why I ultimately decided to fundraise is because I couldn't we were growing so fast, I couldn't self-finance mm. the growth. And um, we were leaving a lot of money on the table. Mm. And I also felt a responsibility to convert people who were working as contractors or bloggers into a more sustainable, like, living baseline wage. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still startup wages, but, you know, something is better than nothing. Yeah. Um, so it was about the summer after Blavity launched 2015 when I went out to try to fundraise. Now, again, Black girl. San Francisco, 2014, not really in vogue. There's a lot of new conversations around equity in VC, and I love that. It's beautiful. There's there's funds dedicated to minorities raising money, but that none of that existed <laughs> when I was out there. Um, so the first thing is identifying why you're fundraising and making a decision on if your business is venture backable or not. And uh, at the time, there was a lot of media companies that were raising money. You had Vice, you had BuzzFeed, you had uh, Upworthy, um, Attention, so many media companies, Mike, for example, some of them exist now, some of them don't. But I had enough data that showed, yes, this is a category that people will spend um, and invest in. Then the second thing is, do you want to be a venture-backed founder? Because mm -hmm, there's another mm -hmm. set of responsibilities that comes from taking outside money. You dilute yourself and give away a piece of your company, and therefore you're giving power away. And the more money you raise, the less power you have, um, and the more people who become your bosses, right? The irony of entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then the last thing is, if I take this money, am I going to be able to give it back at a really high return? Um, at the speed at which this industry requires me to do so. So typically in the venture capital world, they're looking for a five to seven year return timeframe, which means within five to seven years, you need to sell your company or you need to have an IPO, which is a public sale, mm. right? And so am I as the founder willing to commit to a five to seven year timeframe? At the time, I was. 
right? So all of those things were true for me. I went out to raise money and I was really militant and really strict at the time. And so what did I do? I said, I want all black investors. I want an all black board. And this is a black media company. So that's, you know, the people who own this need to be a reflection of our community, right? Mm -hmm. Well, all the black people said no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that was a strike. Um, and they were friendly about it. And I know all these people now and I love them now, but um, it hurt. I mean, that I was like on the floor crying. I mean, it was terrible. I felt like if they don't get me, yeah, then how can somebody else? Yeah. You know, and like, if they don't want to put the money behind this problem that impacts them and their children and their children's children and all the things, then why would Jenny from around the block do it? Yeah. And so I had to sit for a couple of weeks and lick my wounds. And then, you know, um, you know, I was talking to some people in my network and they said, well, have you considered social impact investors? And I had never heard of social impact investors. I was like, I don't even know what you, what are you talking about? And a social impact investor is someone or a fund who wants to make investments in venture backable startups and enterprise investments, not, not investing in nonprofits. And but they do have a strong uh, fiduciary responsibility to invest in companies that are going to do good. Hmm. So their set of criteria, while they still want money back, they're not looking for as much money back. While they want it fast, if it takes a little longer and you're doing good, it's okay. So <laughs> their set of criteria was was a bit different. Um, and so my first set of investors actually wound up being social impact investors, people mm. who cared deeply about diversity in media and democracy, people who cared deeply about uh, there being examples of companies run by women of color at scale that are profitable, uh, that aren't charities, you know, um, and... That is how I raised my first round of funding, which is around $500,000, which to me was everything. And for a lot of people, that's a lot of money to get started with. So talk to us about the behind the scenes of that. So it's like, how did you find these social impact investors? And then what did, how did you pitch them? Like, what was that? Like, what did you prepare? How, like, what was the meeting like? Because yeah. I think a lot of people don't hear this little like nitty gritty information in terms of fundraising. Yeah, so I had my deck that was, a failure from the first round. <laughs> and so I then, um, I knew that I shouldn't use those same materials because I needed to tell a different story, right? Because mm -hmm. they're evaluating impact. So they're going to want to know, well, how do you help people? How do you measure impact? So I needed to think, put myself in the mindset of these folks and understand mm -hmm. what, like, what their criteria was. Um, and I just did research. I mean, it wasn't glamorous. It's literally just brute force, reading forums, uh, reading things on Reddit, like just research because I didn't know anyone. And um, the second thing was I applied for a program that would give me a certain amount of funding. I think it was like 100K. And they were all a group of social impact investors that were financing the program. And as a part of that process, they gave you all of these templates to fill out, like a financial mm -hmm. template, all these questions to answer. And so I signed up for that program. It was called New Media Ventures. Um, they still exist today and still run this program. And through that process, I was able to put together my three-year projections, financial projections, which again, felt insane to me. I'm like, I'm just making shit up. Like, I don't know what's going to happen in three years. How do you, how are you guys going to know? Do you know something? I don't know. So, you know, there's a lot of things I did that I was like, I don't, I'm just taking a stab. <laughs> yeah. Stab this. Um, I updated my pitch deck, which was pretty straightforward. Like I said, I just updated some of the slides in terms of impact. I told the, the vision of Blavity Inc. and where I wanted to go differently. So I talked about uh, hiring and financing the next generation of journalists. I talked about how the more that you see images in advertising that's a reflection of you, the more it changes your perception about what's possible. And that, you know, I, I talked more about the soft stuff, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then I won that, that first 100K. And then what I did next, and this is what I would recommend for anybody who's fundraising, uh, I then 
asked the people who gave me money to help me finish raising the rest of my round. I mm. tried to make it their responsibility now that they've said yes to me to make me successful. And I don't think enough people put the burden on others to help them be successful mm. when actually it is their job and they want to, right? You say, thank you for the money and you move on. And it's like, no, 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 no. Thank you for the money. We're now married forever. How else can you help me? Mm -hmm. And I said, introduce me to people. I was introduced to people on their board. I was introduced to their financiers. And that's how I filled out the rest of my round was actually all of the really, really wealthy people that were giving them money. Mm. And that kind of created this cover for our initial set of business because I had a really strong network of angel investors and funds who were made this commitment to, you know what, we want to see Morgan and we want to see Blavity grow. Mm -hmm. And how did you decide how much equity you wanted to give away? I hated how much equity I had to give away in the early <laughs> stages. I was shocked and shook at how much these VCs want to give away. So every round, they typically want 10 to 20% of your business every time you raise. And I was like, no, <laughs> I don't want to do that. So actually... That's one of the reasons I stopped fundraising. So I've raised you know, $13 million in the last, you know, over the last six plus years. And I have not raised since 2018 because I do not want to continue to dilute my own ownership and the ownership of my employees and our existing investors. Uh, because every time you do that, you go down 10 to 20%. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I only have given out equity to my executives basically right. who've been on my team because they're putting in sweat equity. They're deciding not to start their own companies to work on this company and so on. So you've given equity to some of your uh, employees and team members. Yeah. Every employee at Blavity gets equity. Um, oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yes. I know I'm a crazy lady, but it was important to me <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because I think Talk to us about why when you become an owner of something, you treat it differently. You know, mm. you treat it differently and you make decisions differently. I believe that. I believe that. Um, I also believe it's core to our mission. We, although we're not a social impact company only, we, I mean, we're for profit enterprise. I do believe that it is my responsibility as a CEO to build a more progressive version of what companies should look like. Mm. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm curious just to understand how that, what does that look like? If somebody signs on, at what point do they get equity? Is it, do they get distributions? Like how does that work? Competition wise? Yeah. yeah. So um, we have, we have salary bands based off of levels. And so our salary bands that are based off of levels also include a, a, a set of stock options. Mm. And those stock options are fair market value of the company. We have a third party that prices the company one to two times a year, and they can buy those stock options if they so choose, which mm -hmm. is a heavily discounted rate. Yeah. And it's, it's a private company. It's a private company. So it's not like yeah. you can sell it. We can buy it back from you, but you cannot sell it on the open market. Mm -hmm. um, and so based off of your level, you get a certain amount of shares and you can buy those shares while you're here. Or if you ever quit or, and or get fired, you have a window in which you could buy those shares. So, you know, things don't work out, fine. Um, the standard for our company is a four-year cycle of vesting with a one-year cliff, meaning you have to be with us for at least a year to get your first 25% of that allocation of shares. Got it. And so this also is good for you because it helps you retain your employees. Is that right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I, I definitely know when people start exercising their shares, I'm always like, hold up. Are you happy? Are you about to leave? Are you okay? What's going on? <laughs> um, but generally, you know, we see people exercise their shares. You know, if they've transitioned, we see that have take place after the fact. People don't generally exercise during the time that they're at the company because yeah. there's really no reason to. Um, but in the event that we sell the company, that means that everybody who has shares gets a check. You know, even if you were part of our vision and mission four years ago. And I think that's mm. beautiful. That is awesome. I want to look into that. It sounds really cool. So talk to us about how Blavity has evolved over the years because it started as a newsletter and I went on your website and I was like, wow, this is like, there's a lot going on here. So what are the types of things that you do today? Mm -hmm. What's your business model? 
Yeah. So Blavity today, we have about 200 employees. We're fully remote all over the the country. Um, Yeah, it's a lot going on. We have two divisions. So really two separate groups of uh, leaders. One is our Blavity Media Group. Blavity Media Group is the original mission of Blavity. We create brands and media brands that speak to our communities. And then we work with advertisers who want to authentically reach those communities. We have big clients, Walmart, MasterCard, Toyota, et cetera, um, that advertise with us. And we have online content and all the good things. Um, we also have a publisher network where we work with multicultural publishers that are independent or smaller than us who don't have the same sales team or ad infrastructure who want to work with the McDonald's or Toyota or other really incredible partners and run their ad operations and monetization for them. Amazing. Yeah. Sounds like we're doing really similar stuff, like some we similar are. stuff. Yeah. We are. And then yeah. our second business, which is... Um, called Afrotech and Talent Infusion is um, really focused on talent acquisition and diversity in the tech space. And it's separate from media because ultimately what we're trying to do is increase the speed in which people of color are able to get jobs and increase the pipeline of talent that stays in tech and stays at these big companies. Mm -hmm. And so we have a huge conference called Afrotech um, that's typically in November And we have uh, memberships and communities as well as a SaaS product behind the scenes that is for corporations to get access to those talent pools Mm. year round. Mm. So let's stick on this topic of diversity. You say diversity must be a true company value. Uh, How do you make sure that you have a diverse workplace? What are some of the things that you do? A couple of things. One is um, first you have to have higher people that are diverse. And when I say diverse, I don't just mean Black people. I mean truly like a diverse set of people across interest groups, religions, um, political interests, particularly if you're building a product that is for a diverse set of consumers. Mm -hmm. Um, The reason for this, and there's a million studies on it, but basically diverse groups come up with better answers and diverse groups come up with better profits (laughs) and... That's we're in business. That's where we are business people. We want profits. Um, so once you hire people, then you have to retain them, which is really, really hard for a lot of companies. They spend all this money to get you. And then when you get there, you're like, I don't want to work here. This is not what you sold me because there's no diversity at the top. And so decisions that are passed through are inconsistent with what they talked about versus how it's actually applied through their workforce, whether that's pay equity, whether that's access to opportunities and mentorship, whether that's even feedback. I recently just read a research study that showed that if you're a woman or a person of color, the type of feedback, the vocabulary of feedback that you get is very generic mm. versus uh, if you're a male or a white or Asian male, you get very specific feedback, which allows you to get better. Mm. So we're just widening the gaps, right? So yeah. diversity has to, and inclusion and equity have to be looked at at every single part of your company along the way. And then, you know, ultimately, I do think it's important that at the top of these companies, your board, your investors, the people who are really making the big decisions need to have uh, inclusion and diversity as a part of their own values mm-hmm. because it does make a difference. I mean, I'm in these boardrooms, I advise big companies, you know, I advise PepsiCo, I advise American Airlines. These decisions are made in the boardrooms. Mm. So you, you've got to have that. And I know that uh, to attract better talent, you say that you celebrate success. Mm-hmm. And this is a great way for you to attract diverse talent. Can you tell us what you mean by that? Yeah. So at our own company, we really try to um, showcase the incredible success of our employees. So if you look at our corporate branding, you look at our corporate social media profiles, you're not going to see a picture of me every five seconds. Like it's not called Morgan to Bond Company, you know? (laughs) (laughs) It's like, it is a corporation and I want to make sure that the work of the people who are working at this company are acknowledged. That's another piece of data that we see often is that women and people of color in the workplace feel underappreciated. And underappreciated, certainly financially, of course, but also just generally they feel like they do a lot of invisible labor Mm -hmm. that's not acknowledged. 
And so we try to encourage companies and even within our own company, create programs like quarterly programs where we acknowledge employees who are doing really good work. We have peer recognition programs so that you can acknowledge, you know, someone you enjoyed working on a project with and they really solved a great problem, a, a great thing that happened with a client and they were quick and they were awesome and they were had a great attitude, you know, so we try to create all these different moments for verbal and financial affirmations of people's success. And I think companies have started to do that. You start to hear about employee engagement. You start to see these teams, you know, chief culture officers. I mean, there's all these different titles in the tech world, mm -hmm. but ultimately it's about engagement. How engaged are your, is your diverse workforce? Mm -hmm. And I know you're also a, propo a proponent of anonymous employee surveys. Who child, yes, because, and I wasn't, used to be not like terrified of them. I used mm -hmm. to be terrified of anonymous surveys. I was like, I don't know if I want to know what they have to say about us. But what I've learned is anonymous surveys create a frequent anonymous surveys. And I think that's the key. Mm. If you do one once a year, you're going to get a bunch of stuff. But if you do these often and it becomes a part of your culture, then people start to feel psychologically safe to share things and things that maybe would be difficult for them to tell their direct manager and boss, or they don't mm. know how to talk about it. And you can identify trends much easier. And in larger corporations, I think creating safe pathways for communication for everyone is really important. And I say everyone because the other thing that we've noticed is that when you create um, systems and tools and cultures that benefit people of color, benefit women, the rest of the group also gets unintended benefits as well. It's just, like, mm. it's just like maternity leave, right? When you had maternity leave, that was great. But parental leave is better because it mm. actually benefits the whole family unit and the birthing person or closed captions. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I'm like, I don't know what these people are saying. Let me turn on closed captions. Well, closed captions used to only be for people who could not hear. Mm. But now we all benefit from closed captions, right? So this idea that we got to go out of out of our way for diversity and all this stuff. I'm like, yeah, but it's gonna make it it's gonna make it better. Mm. That's such a good point. I love that. Um, okay, so let's talk about this corporate mission that you have, which is to advance Black happiness. How do you define Black happiness, and what do you feel like you've achieved already on that front? Yeah, we spend a lot of time on this mission. It's one that's really ambitious, which is important. Um, when you think about happiness. It's hard to be happy when you don't have some fundamentals in place. So, you know, access to safe work environment, access to uh, housing, access to information, equality of treatment, access to and safety in your community, right? There's all these different things that are a barrier to even being happy. Um, and we wanted to start with the top <laughs> and our work our way there. Um I think that you can find moments of joy and happiness in everything that you do. And we wanted to make sure that the work that we are doing every single day at our company is striving towards that. So when mm -hmm. we're evaluating articles or social media posts, I ask the team, is this going to do harm? Is this going to be neutral? Or is this going to be a positive impact on happiness? And they have to think about that question. And sometimes the answer is like, mm, I think it's just neutral, then we don't really need to do it. <laughs> you know, if it's going to be have no impact, why are we wasting our time? Right. Mm -hmm. And so having, uh, I really encourage companies and entrepreneurs as they're building their missions and their values to be ambitious where enough that as you get larger, as you become bigger than you ever thought you could be, and you've got all these people working for you, can they use and leverage your mission and values in their work every single day as just a gut check. Mm, yeah. So you grew this company, you've got over 200 employees, which is super impressive. And as a diverse minority woman, you probably didn't have many leadership experiences before you started your company. Same thing with me. Like, it's like every leadership position that I've ever had was like, I put myself in that. Nobody ever put me in a leadership position. It was like an organization I started or mm -hmm. whatever, right? So talk to us about some of the challenges you had as a leader over the years, just trying to be a good leader to this company without really much experience leading. Yeah. I mean, I made a bajillion of mistakes. I'm sure I make mistakes every day now. Um, 
I think what I've learned to accept and embrace is that I am on a journey where all I can do is control my ability to take input, feedback, and then address it Mm. and uh, address it head on, right? There were times in my life as the leader of this company where I was avoided, where I didn't address it head on. I made all these different excuses. This is sexist. These are expectations that they wouldn't have for a male CEO. These are things that my employees would never say this stuff to a male CEO. This wouldn't ever happen to a white man media company that had the same statistics that I have. These advertisers would never give us these prices, right? I mean, I made all these different excuses and all these different things. But at the end of the day, I'm still who I am, right? Whether those things are true or not true. So it's not really, I learned, it's not really productive for me to spend any energy there and to very quickly move myself towards a place of where it's in my control, what's in my power, and how can I make an impact or improve the things that are in my control and my power. So I took classes. I hired executive coaches. I um, and read a lot of books. I read tons of books. I listen to podcasts. I'm on a million and one newsletters. I mean, I've just made learning and learning how to be a better leader a part of my engine every single day. And I have really close advisors who can give me feedback and call me out and say, "Mm -mm, I don't care if you're black, green, tall, short, Morgan, that was a bad decision. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it was a bad decision. And uh, this is how you need to fix it. Right. Yeah. And just really having a tribe of people who can, who I can go to and trust um, that are invested enough in me and invest enough in the company. And that's my board. Those are my co-founders. Um, typically, they're not like strangers I meet up the street. I mean, it's like people who have really been with me a long time and understand the true vision of what I'm trying to accomplish. And mm-hmm. that would be my advice to anyone is like, Sometimes when people are looking for mentors or advisors, they make this list that's all the way up here. You know, I would love to have, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, maybe no one's saying Mark Zuckerberg, Sheryl Sandberg as my advisor. Or I would love to have Elon Musk as my advisor. And I'm like, really? Like, you know, that's not really realistic. Yeah. <laughs> so get real. Let's get real, you know. But who has been rocking with you for a long time, who is successful, maybe in a different industry, who you can have quarterly meetings with or quarterly lunches or dinners with. Um, and that's how I've, I've been able to um, accelerate, I think, my growth, and my personal development, and also pay it forward to other people through my own advisorship or, you know, my own podcast so that along the way, I can be that for other people. Mm-hmm. Well, I have to ask you, I don't have a board. I always think about starting a board and uh, then I just get too busy and I never start a board, right? I like... Like half, I have like some people with their toes in, right? But don't have a a formal board. If you have a formal board, how is it structured? I do have a formal board. Um, When you take venture capital after a certain stage, you have to have a formal board board Mm. because they take ten to twenty percent of their company of the company, and they want to watch you. (laughs) Mm. They have the rights to information. Um, I have a board meeting coming up soon. So it's it's your it's the people who invested who are on the board. That's right. So okay. it's the biggest investors uh, take the biggest seats, take the seats, and um, it's typically an odd number. So my board is small; it's three people. Um, some boards are seven, some boards are nine. I mean, it can, some boards are huge, mm-hmm. um, and we vote on the most important things. So if I want to do an acquisition, I have to get board approval. If uh, they set my salary. Right? I mean, I work for the board. I am the chairperson of the board. I'm also CEO, which are really two separate roles. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there may be a time where we hire a CEO. The CEO reports to the board, right? And the chairperson is the head of the board. So mm-hmm. I have double roles. Um, but at some point, you probably won't see me as CEO. <laughs> yeah. And, and I'll still control the board, but that will be, um, you know, a different phase of life for me. But basically, that's how it's set up. And I, I recommend that people consider, even if it's an informal board, you don't have to have one with voting rights and all these different things. Because learning to organize your information on a quarterly basis and track key performance indic- indicators for your company makes you a better leader. And it also helps your leaders become better leaders. So the people reporting into you know 
that you need to go and justify these decisions or these hires or these budgets every 90 days. Mm. And that has made us a better company. It has made us a better workplace. It has made us a more like equitable workplace because everything is clear and written down. There's none of this like, just because she wants to. Mm. <laughs> like, <laughs> no. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and I think that has been really helpful as to why we've been able to grow and mature so quickly. Mm -hmm. Another, my last question for you on entrepreneurship. I know from me starting my own company as a side hustle and then it growing so fast, you had a very similar experience. My relationships really took a toll, especially like the first four years of all of oh, this. Yeah. Uh, talk to us about that. Like how, how much did you have to sacrifice personally? And then now that you've got your feet on the ground, how do you prioritize your life yeah. with entrepreneurship? I mean, you know, like I really do feel like we were, we were living parallel universes, <laughs> but like, it's brutal. You know, I was single for a long time or I had terrible mm -hmm. situationships and, you know, just, I wasn't a great partner. There's no way. I mean, I'm working 12, 16 hour days. Yeah. I don't have capacity for your stuff. I barely have capacity for my stuff, mm -hmm. you know? And then the type of people that I was dating or in relationship with, then you wind up dating people who also have a bunch of stuff going on because that's the only way that you feel okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? So, um, yeah, I mean, like, I had a lot of tragic situations, but I think eventually I had to make a decision on, do you ever want to have a partner in life? Do mm -hmm. you ever want to be healthy and not have to meditate for an hour to get to work because you've got so much going on? I used to wake up in the middle of the night, you know, with, with my laptop and just turn over and just, just tech, 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 you know? So that was not sustainable for me. That was not mm -hmm. the life that I wanted when I looked into the future and um, it took a lot of hard work and intentionality and behavior shifts to get me to the, the place where I am now. I have physically left LA. I live in Nashville, Tennessee, mm. because part of it was the physical environment was one that was really hard for me to say no to all the things that were coming my way. Mm -hmm. My fam, I wanted to be closer with my family. You know, I wanted to have Sunday dinners with my parents. I wanted to just like be slightly more normal. Mm -hmm. Yep. <laughs> um, and I wanted to put myself potentially in a position to find a, a partner. Um, and if I wanted a family at some point to be able to have a community and a culture in which that family was going to wind up, you know, not with my 12 year old doing drugs in LA, but somebody who'd be like, oh yes, I don't even know what cannabis is. I mean, I don't think that's really the reality <laughs> for these kids these days, but like just a little bit more innocent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the things going on in New York and LA. Yeah. Um, you see a lot in these spaces and it wasn't easy. Um, people thought I was nuts when I left LA. I mean, it's like, how can you be so successful and have all these things and all these employees and stuff, but you live in like Tennessee? It's making sense. But it does make sense to me. Yeah. And it's worked out. Yeah. And nowadays, as an entrepreneur, you can be just online crushing it. You don't need to be in physical spaces at least all the time anymore. So you have a book coming out. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about this book. What is it called? What is it going to be about? When does it come out? Yeah. So I'm finishing writing it now. The mm. book comes out next year, next fall. Um, and it's all about helping other ambitious people define life and their success for themselves. Mm -hmm. And anyone who is like, even if you're good, if you're like, I'm good, but I'm not great. Like, I want to get to the point where I'm living every week in my purpose. And that might mean I'm a stay-at-home mom and I'm doing pickup and drop off and I'm investing in my hobbies and I'm living a beautiful life. That's great. It could mean I'm starting a media company and I'm growing this thing and I'm trying to figure out how to navigate all these choices I need to make. But the real person that it is for is somebody who aspires to have a vision of the life that they want to live. And then they're willing to make some tough temporary choices like you and I have to get there. Yeah. And basically showing them how. 
Well, awesome. I can't wait to have you back on to talk about that book. So we'll have you back on in six months or so when you're done and the book is coming out. Thank you so much. I end my show with two questions that I ask everyone. So the first one is one, what is one actionable thing our young and profiters can do today to become more profitable tomorrow? Invest in yourself, whether that's mm. books, Audible, you know, whether that is investing in the stock market so you have some safety net, whatever it may be, invest in yourself. You're going to get paid so much more dividends if you invest in yourself before material things. I totally agree. Getting as many skills as possible is so key, especially in 2023 and beyond. And what is your secret to profiting in life? And this can go beyond business, beyond financial, beyond the topic of today's episode. The key to profiting in life is, ooh, so many things. I think that my core key to profiting in life is to be happy and joyful and in peace in my everyday. Like to be totally, fully like I love today, not always mm. wishing and wanting for more. Yes, mm. putting in the work during the day to get to my more but being totally satisfied. If I ran this day back every day, I'm good. Mm. Yeah, it's so true. Satisfaction is so important to happiness. And then we're just like always chasing something else and never being happy. So Mm -hmm. I really like that you said that. Morgan, where can everybody learn more about you and everything that you do? You can listen to my podcast, The Journey Podcast, um, where I talk about all the things, all my challenges, all the things I fuck up on all the time. Um, (laughs) And then all my fun friends along the way. Um, you can follow me on TikTok if you want the crazy weird me, and you can follow me on Instagram, of course, if you want the more curated version, uh, such as Instagram is these days. Awesome. Well, I'll stick all those links in the show notes. I'll make sure that everybody follows you. Morgan, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. 